Welcome to episode three of the Clubby Podcast. I'm your host and your neighborhood clubhouse attendant, Greg Larson. And today I want to talk about an obscure phenomenon that I think even a lot of big time baseball nuts don't know about. And it's this phenomenon, I call it the burning bat phenomenon. And in order to describe what this is, I'm going to read a section from my, uh, you can't see it, you can see it on the live stream, John. Uh, but uh, this is the advanced copy of Clubby, which you can see here in the background of the uh, YouTube video. But I'm going to read a section from the chapter called The Boatload Mentality to lead us into this concept. They say that the true fireballers can throw a baseball so fast that when a batter follows it straight back, he can put the bat up to his nose and smell the wood burning. This only happens when someone just misses crushing the ball. It spins so ferociously that the momentary friction of the leather and seams against the grain of the bat creates a burn. On July 3, Enrico Jimenez didn't light any bats on fire. Jimenez came off the mound to a chorus of boos from the record-breaking Ripken Stadium crowd of 6,904 many of whom were, let's be honest, only in attendance to see the post-game fireworks rather than the five and 10 Ironbirds. And so that concept of throwing a ball so fast and a batter just missing crushing it, I always thought this was a, one of those old wives' tales from baseball. One of those things that was more superstition than anything. So the, the way it works is, I'm a batter standing here and a guy is throwing 95 miles an hour. Say I swing and I don't completely whiff, but I don't make strong contact with it. I just usually undercut it. I undercut the ball and it's almost like that glancing blow is so, it's so close to the edge of the bat that it literally burns the wood just because there's so much, uh, friction of that leather of the baseball spinning against the wood for that fraction of a second. And the ball actually speeds up when it goes straight back. And so like, it has to be at the perfect angle. It can't be, it, the ball can't make too much contact with the bat. And it, it's just, it has to be just perfect. And I've only seen one piece of video that actually shows this phenomenon happening. And it was a game on July 24th, 2020, between the Minnesota Twins and the Chicago White Sox. It was the bottom of the fifth inning, two out, man on first, one, one count, I believe. Uh, Trevor Mays pitching for the Minnesota Twins and um, Edwin Encarnacion is batting for the White Sox. And Encarnacion is a power hitter now. And Trevor May is a fireballer thrower. He touches 96 regularly. And my apologies to John on the live stream on Instagram. You can't see the video on my computer, but I want to show you, this is the only instance that I've seen this happen. So it's a two, one count. Trevor May, boom. You can see like, so you can see there that Encarnacion took a home run swing at it and he just barely missed crushing the ball and he didn't whiff completely, but you can see how much the ball it angled straight back just over the catcher's head. And it almost seemed to speed up as it went back. And now watch what Encarnacion, I've never, I've seen a, a miss hit like that before, but what I've never seen is video evidence, 95 mile an hour pitch. What I've never seen is video evidence of a guy. Then you can see him look at the bat and he holds it up to his nose to sniff it. He literally put the bat up to his nose and sniffed to get that burning wood smell because it is a rare thing. It is an interesting thing that anybody would even bother doing that too. Like, I'm sure he smelled wood burning before, but it's like one of those baseball phenomenons where just a, a little abnormality in the middle of a regular season game in this case in the middle of a pandemic it's seven to five bottom of the fifth two outs man on first and there's just some it's like a little treat in the middle of a game where 
you just missed hitting a fucking dinger and you get a little sniff of that maple bat burning it's um it's a rare treat and so that's one of those things that you hear about um but i've never seen anybody actually do it other than that um and so yeah i mean as far as bats go this one i've never seen any video evidence or any sort of journalistic evidence to support before this next topic is more of a conspiracy theory i suppose and in order to explain it to you i'm going to read a deleted scene from clubby and i cut this scene because i really liked the details of this scene what I like to call lovingly the uh, maple bat conspiracy. It's like, it's such a fun, obscure piece of baseball knowledge or, you know, hypothesis that I wish I could include all of that stuff in the book, but it just, it was so hard to explain this concept, just the, like the physics of this concept about maple bats uh, that it just had to cut it out. So it's only, you know, it's only three pages or so, short pages. I'm going to just read this deleted scene. This is a deleted scene from Clubby. Where Nicole and I lived in North Augusta, South Carolina, we were just a mile from the town recreation center. In that rec center was a trophy case dedicated to North Augusta High School alumnus Tyler Colvin, who was selected by the Chicago Cubs in the first round of the 2006 draft. Four years later, in 2010, he had made his way up to the Cubs as an everyday outfielder. By September 19th of 2010, Tyler had a 254 batting average with 20 home runs and 56 RBI, a very good season for a rookie, and was playing right field against the Miami Marlins in an afternoon game. In the top of the second inning, Colvin was on third base when Cubs catcher Wellington Castillo came up to the plate. Wellington pummeled a little 90 mile an hour sinker over the inside part of the plate. The drive one hopped off the hard afternoon dirt of the warning track in left field and bounced over the fence for a ground rule double. Colvin, with a walking lead off of third base, watched the trajectory of the ball as it sailed into the left field corner, head turned over his left shoulder as he jogged home. He had no idea that the solid double to left came off a broken bat hit. He couldn't have guessed that a large chunk of the barrel on Wellington's maple bat had broken off and was coming right for him. The sharp end of the wood pierced Colvin's chest as he jogged home, puncturing his lung. Colvin was rushed to the hospital and he made a full recovery, but he sat out for the rest of the season. The incident raised questions about the dangers of maple bats, but nothing substantial ever came of it. Though I met one guy later in the 2013 season who had his own theory about MLB's maple bat policy. His name was Steve Clevenger, and the Orioles had just gotten him in a trade with the Cubs. He came to Aberdeen for a rehab stint before heading up to the big club in Baltimore. During his time with the Ironbirds, he shared a little conspiracy theory about maple bats with a couple of players and me. You know how they always tell you to hit with the label up, Clevenger said. He was referring to the old baseball adage that when you make contact with the ball, the label, like the Louisville Slugger label on Lenny Marullo's bat, that's a reference to earlier in the book, should be facing upward because the label was on the weakest part of the bat. If the label was facing the sky, when you made contact, that meant you were hitting the ball on the straightest and strongest grains on the wood. We nodded. Give me your bat, he said. One of the guys handed him an ash bat. See how the label is on the fat, weak part of the grain? We nodded again. And here I'm going to, here's a picture that shows you what the fat weak part of the grain looks like and what, what, where the label is placed. Now look at my bat, Steve said. His was a maple bat with his signature engraved on it. See the labels on the thin parts of the grain. Sure enough, the label and signature weren't where we expected it. Instead on that compact part of the grain where you should be making compact contact with the ball. If he followed the old adage of hit with the label up, with his bat, he would have made he would make contact on the fat, weak part of the grain. 
We look back up to him a tad confused. If you hold it with the label up with this one, he said of his maple bat, you won't get as much power, but it won't break in those large shards. That's why MLB wants the bat companies to change the label spot. We all looked at each other. I don't think any of us bought it at the time. I've never seen any evidence to validate Clevenger's claim. Again, like in the last episode, I talked about the, the difference between baseballs, a minor league baseball and a major league baseball and an NCAA baseball and the differences in, in seam heights and how that can impact your ability to throw more violent breaking balls. The, the old ad, similar to that being borderline superstitious, this old adage of hit with the label up, I think is also borderline superstitious because the idea is the idea is that you want to make contact with the baseball with as many grains shown on the, let's, how to put it. When you look at a wood bat, it's built in layers, right? You have the, you have these layers of the, really they're called grains, but it looks like layers when you look at the end of the bat. And what you want to do is you want to make contact with the baseball on this edge because there are all these layers notched in the wood all these grains and so you want to make you want to make contact with the baseball here because it's the most compact highest density part of the bat but if you hold it up like this the bat you're not making contact with these these dense parts of the bat you're making contact with this this flat theoretically weaker part of the bat. And so normally, normally a Louisville slugger um, stamp or logo, for example, label is placed on the top here. So like the grains are going horizontally and the label is on the top. Therefore, if you hit with the label up, you are making contact with the ball on the fat, uh, on the um, thin parts of the grain, the com most compact parts of the grain. What Steve was saying was that MLB was so worried about Im injuries like Tyler Colvin's injury, where maple bat, maple bats would shatter in these large shards all at once. And in this case, puncture a dude's fucking lungs. MLB was so worried about that, that they wanted to change the location of the label so that players would still hit with that same adage, you know, hit with the label up. But if they change the location of the label to being on top, the normal contact position where the, the grains are running all along next to each other and they put the label on the normal contact position, if I hit with the label up with one of those new maple bats, I'm going to make contact with the ball on the weakest part of the grain. The weakest part of the grain is not good for the players because they're not going to make a solid of contact with the ball, but it's better for injury rates for major league baseball as a whole, because their bats won't shatter as violently uh, as they would if they were hitting the other way. I mean, it's all so goddamn convoluted. I can barely explain it, which is why I didn't leave it in the book. But it's just another one of those, like, I couldn't find any physics evidence to back it up. I mean, the most I could find was that um, the reason maple bats are more popular, they have a smaller sweet spot than ash bats. Sweet spot being, you know, the spot in the barrel that you make really good contact with that uh, makes the ball go flying farther. Maple bats have a, a smaller sweet spot, but the wood is more compact and denser, uh, which makes the ball fly farther. Whereas ash is a softer wood and it'll, sh when it shatters it, it'll flake away. Like Tony Gwynn, uh, Joe Maurer was another one of these guys. Tony Gwynn was a low strikeout guy, as I'm sure you know, he did not, he made a lot of contact. He hit for a high average. He did not strike out a lot and he didn't have a lot of miss hits. He was the kind of guy he would use a bat for so long because he made such good contact with the ball that he would just stop using it because the 
the grain would just start to sort of fleck away. Whereas most guys, they might not, they might not use a bat for a week at a time because they'll break it on a sinker or something that runs in on the handle. Um, so I don't know what the hell I was saying that for, but like an ash bat will flake away. Whereas a, a maple bat will break all at once in knives of shards. So they're more dangerous. I think major league baseball doesn't like that. When I was on the, when I was a, a clubhouse attendant for the Aberdeen Ironbirds, as, uh, as told in my new forthcoming memoir, clubby, a minor league baseball memoir, major league baseball would provide bats for players uh, in the minors. So in our case, we were uh, we were an affiliate with the Baltimore Orioles. So the big club in Baltimore would ship us bats. And now, mind you, uh, bonus babies. Bonus babies are the players who uh, they got a big signing bonus from the team. They're drafted in a high round, and the they were called bonus babies because people thought that they were taken care of better than say somebody drafted in the 48th round, which is totally true, but they would usually have an agent who would send them bats or they'd have some deal with a bat company and they'd send them maple bats, like no agent or no sponsor company would send ash bats to a professional ball player unless requested, I believe, because maple was the high quality shit, more expensive and more dangerous but higher quality in terms of making strong contact with the ball. So what did Major League Baseball do? At least the Orioles. The Orioles sent shitty ash bats to their minor leaguers. And I doled them out. There were these Rawlings, uh, bone rubbed, just horse shit. I mean, they would break like fucking toothpicks. They were such bad bats. Um, but they're always ash. And I think part of it was money, but part of it was, I think, this little pet conspiracy theory that Steve Clevenger told us about that um, Major League Baseball didn't like that, maybe maybe still doesn't like that maple bats are more dangerous. So they're not interested in doling those out to their players because it's more money and it leads to more injuries like that one to Tyler Colvin in 2010. And I ran this scam when I was with the team where I would – so the guys, the low draft pick guys who didn't have any sort of, um, didn't have money, they needed to get bats for me. They didn't have an agent to send them bats. So what I would do is I would run this, this scam basically where a player would break a bat in batting practice or they'd break a bat in a game. And if they wanted to get a new bat, they would have to turn it into me, that broken bat, in order for me to give them a new one. There's a trade. Uh, and then what I would do is I would take those broken bats up to the clubhouse or up to the, uh, the game. I was going to say the game room. What's it called? The gift gift shop called the hangar at uh, Ripken Stadium called the hangar because the Aberdeen Ironbirds were named. So in part, they're named after the owner, Cal Ripken Jr., he had that Iron Man streak where he played in tw- like 2,600 games in a row. I think it's 2,632, something like that. So they called him Iron Man. And then the Birds is based on the Orioles, nicknamed the Birds, the parent team. And then in Aberdeen, the town where the team played, also the Ripkins' hometown, there was a, a proving ground or like an Air Force base that had – uh, I was going to say ships. What are spaceships called when they're on Earth? Planes. They had these planes, fighter jets, that were nicknamed Iron Birds. Hence, all of those factors together, calling the team the Iron Birds. And p- punning off of that, the gift shop was called the Hangar, like the airplane hangar. So I would take the broken bats that the players traded me, take them up to the hangar. And what I'd do is I'd take a little bit of uh, athletic tape and some permanent marker, and I'd write down the name and number of the player whose bat it was. And then fans would buy those broken bats for 20 bucks a pop because they'd say, oh my God, it's Trey Mancini's broken bat. What if he becomes a major leaguer? Which he did. It's like, oh my God, this is Mikey Stremski's broken bat. What if he becomes a major leaguer like his uh, grandpa, Hall of Famer, Carl Yastrzemski, which happened. 
And so what I found out was, yeah, you know, nobody was, there's, there's no like fact checking with this kind of thing. The, nobody's saying like, oh, whose bat was this? Uh, oh, it's technically not Mike Yastrzemski's. The clubby police are going to come in and tell you that you can't bring it up to the gift shop. No, I would just start making up. I'd say, oh, this is Mike Yastrzemski's bat. Oh, this one's Trey Mancini's bat because those ones sold faster. And I had a deal with the gift shop where I would get $7.50 for every broken, every $20 broken bat they sold. So the more I could do something to get those bats sold, uh, the more money I would make. <laughs> but I also didn't want to, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to flood the market with too many Yastrzemski, uh, Mancini bats, other popular players. So I'd throw in a few like no name kind of guys like Kimmel or Hernandez just to make sure that nobody actually, you know, that the supply, supply and demand still worked in our favor. I think I stopped making up those names on the bats one day when I went up to the, I went up to the hangar gift shop. I had an armful of broken bats. It was the end of a road trip. A bunch of players needed new bats. They traded them in. I got their old ones, brought them up to the gift shop. And Don, the guy who ran the gift shop, he said, all right, we we're just, he had a barrel in the back that had all the broken bats and it was empty. He's like, all right, we got a new shipment in. Uh, I'm excited. He never, I mean, he was never going to fact check me because he was getting money off of it too. So it's just kind of like this unspoken agreement, like so many things in baseball, just going unspoken and continuing on in perpetuity. And it just so happened that one of the front office people, uh, was in the hangar, the gift shop while I was in there. And he comes up, sees me drop in all the bats. And he's like, oh my God, another Mike Yastrzemski bat. I got to buy this one. He said he bought one last week, a Mike Yastrzemski bat. And um, he was so excited about it that he had gotten one before anybody else had purchased it. And I was like, there's just a part of me that died inside because that bat could have been anybody's. Like, I just I just slapped a, a name at the bottom and wrote, yeah, it's number 28. But for the rest of his life, he was going to think that he had this connection to like this baseball dynasty of the Yastrzemski's like, oh my God, Carl Yastrzemski's grandson, I have his bat. When in fact, that bat might've been broken in batting practice by some guy who didn't last the season just because I wanted to make an extra $7 and 50 cents. And yeah, it's kind of funny and it's kind of cute, but it's also like I was profiting off of somebody else's desire to be connected to something greater than themselves. And it was a shitty feeling making that realization. And I think after that point, I was more honest with who actually broke these bats and who didn't, because there were some cash cows in there. Anthony Vega outfielder from Manhattan university, I believe he was an outfielder for the iron birds in 2012. He broke bats. That dude would go through batting practice and break six bats just in batting practice. Um, and he was not a bonus baby. Like he did not have an agent sending him maple bats. So he would turn those MFers into me and get more. Uh, who knows how many hundreds of dollars I made off of his broken bats, but he didn't have the name recognition as some of the other guys. Uh, but I went back to, um, you know, being honest with it eventually. Jordan Cheney, hello. On the live chat. But yeah, uh, that's it. That's that's all the obscure knowledge I know about baseball bats. <laughs> um, this has been episode three of the Clubby podcast. Now, a couple of things about the Clubby podcast in the book. We just got advanced copies of Clubby. We don't have hard back, but they are paperback. Uh, you can see it in the live stream and you can kind of see it on the YouTube. We have advanced copies. If you're interested in getting an advanced copy, my publisher wants me to send these to as many eager fans as possible. Leave a comment on wherever you see this video. Just leave a comment that says I'm in. I'll see it. I'll DM you. We'll find a way to get you a copy. If uh, you're not comfortable sharing your address to get a hard copy to you, that's totally fine. I'll give you details on how to get a digital copy. 
if you want to pre-order the book, go to Amazon and type in C-L-U-B-B-I-E and you'll be able to see the book there. It comes out on April 1st. Go to clubbybook.com for more content, for more, oh yeah, um, clubbybook.com for more content. I have deleted scenes up there, um, just like the Tyler Colvin deleted scene that I read today. I have, there's video up there. We're gonna we're getting the merchandise all taken care of. We're gonna have that up soon. And we're gonna have all sorts of fun new content going up there, including more episodes of the Clubby Podcast. But until next time, I'm Greg Larson, your friendly neighborhood clubhouse attendant. Have a great day.